All right, so I found this cool uh, video of Ned Block giving a series of talks. Um, <clears throat> it's like five hours of talks. I think it's five different talks or whatever. So let's go ahead and check it out. Well, let's see what's happening over here. So cool. In fact, the all of the four uh, talks will be about uh, the issue that uh, Pierre mentioned, uh, whether the conceptual achievement involved in noticing is distinct from uh, the perceptual achievement involved in seeing something. So uh, the way I like to put the issue, it's our... Hold on a second. I got to open my cookie. I'm going to have a little tea and a cookie while I listen to this. But, uh, you know, this is, an, this is something that he's been going on in for a long time about, about whether cognition is fundamentally separate from consciousness. So, so right there. Our feeling that it's consciousness and thought cognition fundamentally different. And I will be talking in all four talks about the issue of conscious vision, and I'll be contrasting that with knowledge of what's seen. That's the conceptual cognitive part. And the overall thesis of the lectures is that conscious perception can be non-conceptual, and I'll explain what I mean by that, and distinct from any kind of cognition or representation. Is this thing on? Okay, good. Okay, so I'll start. At the equivalent of being on mute on Zoom. This is a thesis that Block has been arguing for for like my as long as I can remember, like his whole career basically. That there's cognition on the one hand, and then there's consciousness on the other hand. And then so for people like me who like the higher order theory of consciousness, and then the higher order theory of consciousness associates it with specifically some cognition, like a kind of thought in the higher order thought theory, then this view would be at odds with that view. Um, so whether it's true or not, I don't know. There are days where I, th I think this could be right. So let's see. Let's continue. With the well-known debate that Pierre uh, alluded to about whether perception is rich or sparse. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my view is that um, the resolution is that perception is rich, but cognition is sparse. And that shows that conscious perception must be in part distinct from cognition. So as everybody uh, I'm sure knows, the, one of the kinds of experiments that suggest the rich view is the famous Sperling experiment in which you subjects briefly see an array of, of, of letters. And if asked to report, they can name three or four, w once the letters have gone away, they can, they can name three or four of them. But if clued, cued to one row by a high tone, a, a, another row by a, a medium tone, another row by a low tone, they can report three or four from any given row. And this is known as partial report superiority because if you add up the, the, the capacity um, from all the rows, it's a lot more than the capacity of just reporting without a cue. And um, in the original 1960 paper on this, George Sperling said that subjects enigmatically insist that they have seen more than they can report afterwards. And he and I take the experiment to provide some support for that. However, there is also support for a different idea, that perception is sparse. And everybody, I'm sure, is aware of the famous change blindness experiments. But nonetheless, I will show you an example, if I can make it start. So of those of you who haven't already seen this, how many of you see what's changing? Well, how many have already seen this particular display? How many don't see what's changing? Let me just, OK, so I'm going to show you what's changing. And you'll be, you, I hope you'll be surprised when you see it's that. OK, so why is that surprising? We think we see, um, uh, you know, we, we see a large expanse of, of, uh, of, of our, our things in our visual field. Uh, but then, surprisingly, something can disappear or appear or change color, and people don't notice what it is. Or people don't notice. They may notice that something is different, but not notice what it is. So here is an eye tracking trace for one of these displays. I, unfortunately, the, the actual change blindness thing, oh my god, it really doesn't. I hope that these are all. Anyway, there's a bar back here. 
And in the change blindness display, this bar is first here, then it's here, then it's there, then it's there, and subjects typically don't notice. And this gives you an account, a partial account of why, because if you look at the eye tracking trace, um, only a very small number of hits are on the bar treated by the subject as background. And you can make these displays by changing something that's background. And there are two interpretations. To ma I'll mention a third one, but it's less useful than these two. There are two interpretations of this. One is the fairly standard inattentional blindness interpretation, which is you don't see the features that change. The second interpretation is my interpretation, which is that you do see the features that change, but you don't conceptualize them at a level that would allow you to notice the change. So it's the distinction that Pierre mentioned between seeing and noticing. So the inintentional blindness idea gives uh, a, a force to the sparse phenomenology where um, the phenomenology is the content of consciousness. For example, whether you are consciously seeing something red or consciously seeing something green. Um, the inintentional lack of access to the difference, my view, um, suggests rich phenomenology with sparse cognition. So um, the view that the inattentional blindness view um, uh, suggests that the attentional bottleneck is Right, so I had a lot I wanted to say about that, but that cookie was good. <laughs> We're going to talk about consciousness. Got to have some first. What's all this vision stuff? I like taste. <clears throat> We're turning to a me eating food video. Go back here a second. <coughs> so right here, he's contrasting two different views. One, the inattentional blindness view, as he's so calling it, which is where you don't consciously see. He just says you don't see it, but you don't you don't experience the thing um, that's changing in the change by scenarios. In the other case, you you do con you do see them, but you don't conceptualize them at a level that would allow you to notice a report. So you see it, but you don't bring you don't apply a category uh, concept to it, <clears throat> but you experience it just not in without you know it being categorized as a block or as a bar or whatever. Um, and the problem that I've always had with that, and I made videos about this, you can find them on my channel from before, but the problem that I've always had with this is that the, there's a certain view which could allow this <clears throat> was the case, and yet still cognition would be the central thing in conscious experience. So take the higher order thought theory. So... This is, I don't know why people have such a difficult time making sense of this. So let's go back to this example here. Okay. So on Block's view, you have a conscious experience of each and everything in this array right here. But you don't conceptualize or categorize each and every individual thing as a letter. <clears throat> so you can't report all of them, but yet you feel like you can. Why? Because you kind of categorize or conceptualize it as a bunch of letters, but you don't categorize each specific letter as the, what letter it is. So you get this one up here where you are attending or whatever, M N X L. But these ones over here, according to Block, you have a conscious experience of these shapes and colors, but you categorize it or conceptualize it <coughs> at some letters or other. Okay, great. Now on the higher order view, let's say, 
your conscious experience, your phenomenology is going to be determined by the way you represent the thing you're conscious of, the states. So if this is it right here, and you say, I am seeing, suppose the higher order thought has the content, I am seeing the letters M, N, X, L in the top row and some other letters in those other two rows. So it represents it in a very vague, underspecified way. But the thing that it's under specifying is this stuff, the R, T, J, S, K, Y, G, B. It's all that stuff. So that's there. And you may even imagine that you have a state in the visual system that carries all of this information. In fact, you have to because the subject can be queued to any one of these rows and report pretty well the letters there. <laughs> so Block's idea is that you consciously experience each one of these, but don't categorize it as an R, for example, just some letters. So on the higher order view, you unconsciously have these represented, but you consciously experience some letters. So the same content that Block postulates, right, some letters or other, the difference between the two views is over what your phenomenology is like, what the experience that you have, what the content of it is. So on Block's view, the content of your experience is this straight line, this in black and this background. It's like these shapes. You don't know that there's an R, a T, a J, but it's that letter, that shape that's there. Whereas on the, uh, the kind of higher view I was just sketching, the, the experience is just some letters. But in both cases, you see all the letters. So this way of putting the, the contrast has always bothered me this way right here. Um, because this is exactly what the higher order view says. It says you see the features, but you don't conceptualize them and allow it a way to notice. <clears throat> Whereas here it says you don't see the features. So of course the word see, he means consciously see. But even there, the higher order theory could say, look, you consciously see the difference. That there's a bar, there's a bar. So you consciously see it, but you don't conceptualize it as the thing that's changing. So in a way, the two sides completely agree, even though at a, at a, terminologically, it sounds like they completely agree. And so the real issue is over this the content of the representations which allow you to make this report and whether you experience them in the detail that they have. That's the rich view, as opposed to the sparse view, which says you experience them in this um, in the way that you conceptualize them. All right. So that's really the issue, it seems to me. This way of putting it um, <clears throat> has always bothered me. Anyway, back to the back interpretation, to which is that you do see the features that change, but you don't conceptualize them at a level that would allow you to notice the change. So it's the distinction that Pierre mentioned between seeing and noticing. So the inintentional blindness idea gives uh, a, a force to the sparse phenomenology where um, the phenomenology is the content of consciousness. For example, whether you are consciously seeing something red or consciously seeing something green. Um, the inattentional lack of access to the difference, my view, um, suggests rich phenomenology with sparse cognition. So it, it, as we just said, it doesn't necessarily suggest that because you could have sparse phenomenology with this lack of access to it. Um, suggests rich phenomenology with sparse cognition. So um, the view that the inattentional blindness view um, uh, suggests that the attentional bottleneck is, is, is prior to the formation of the conscious percept. So the idea is that, uh, uh, the, uh, th that the information is restricted, perception is sparse, and therefore cognition is sparse. On my view, perception is rich and the attentional bottleneck comes between that rich perception and the cognition, which, as I will explain, involves broadcasting in the global workspace. Um, so, so this again is why <clears throat> really in the background, 
and this is something I've said in a lot of other places as well, but really Ned's always arguing against global workspace theory. And that's his primary target, the primary, uh, or other versions of flat-footed representationalism, like, you know, Ty and Dresky and those guys. Yeah, but in this debate, he's always got in mind that the sparse camp is the global workspace camp. And I don't think he's really ever addressed the higher order side of things. Um, and remember, I don't really know if the higher order theory is true. Uh, I don't know. Um, I think it's pretty implausible that you know, consciousness could just turn out to be a kind of thought. But I don't think that it's so implausible that we have ruled it out. But anyway, so this this blind spot <laughs> in, uh, in Bloch's <clears throat> thinking doesn't allow him to see really that the, the the there's the debate is over whether the the qualities the 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 representations um, <clears throat> that you want to count as perceptual so the the very rich perceptual representations um, whether those things are conscious in the sense of there being something that it's like, whether they're phenomenally conscious or whether it's only after the attentional bottleneck and what makes it into cognition that is conscious or whether there is, you know, cognition that's independent of this root, which has something to do with consciousness. So I, I think those options aren't really being explored, although maybe we'll see this is a five hour video, so. <laughs> That's the opposition of the talk. Those are the two views that are going to, that I'm going to be that are going to be opposed. Um, now there are some kinds of so-called change blindness that give slight intuitive support to the view that I'm holding. The Slow change blindness. I'm guessing. Of access. I knew and here it. is one that I'm going to just start up. So there's a slow change going on, and your job is to see what the, that slow change is. Let's try to get rid of the uh, line there. So something's changing slowly. How many have seen this before? Okay. <laughs> How many? So I've seen this before. In fact, I'm actually involved in an experiment where we're using this stimulus uh, to try and test exactly this kind of thesis. So first, let's just see. See the change? See what's changing that is? When I first saw this, I did not see the change. When I first saw this, I did not see the change, um, which is super surprising. Okay, so the thing that changed is this. This started off red, and so here are the two pictures. Yeah. Started off like that, ended up like that. Now, here's the point that I would... So, first of all, that's surprising because it's like very large part of the visual scene. You're told something is changing, so you're looking around. And I think that the, if I could predict a little bit, the, the, the thing here is that in the other case, we can make a case that your eyes never really landed on it, perhaps. So maybe that's why you didn't, you just didn't see it, right? But in this case, it's harder to make the case that you didn't see the thing in question, that your eyes didn't land on it. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a stronger case to be made that the two uh, different colors <laughs> made it into the visual processing stream. Um, now your eyes are open, nothing is blocking you, you're looking around, so you must have seen it, right? That's the, I, I share that intuition. I just think that it could also be the result of stuff in cognition. That's in fact what we're one of the things that we're looking at in the experiment I'm associated with. But let's hear what he says. With this, at least on the face of it, you must have seen that color. Right. Consciously seen the color. So it supports, at least mildly, my... There's no... That's Ned. <laughs> oh, Neddy, Ned, Ned. Notice what he just did right there. He said, you must have consciously seen the color. So that mildly supports my position. Uh, it's a little backpedaling there. So it's not clear that you must have consciously seen the color. What must have happened is that your eyes landed on it um, and that the light reflected from there made it into the visual processing stream. But must you have consciously like experienced the color 
suppose that you're looking around and you, you sort of see the color of that red in the first screen and then you you don't update it uh, so you just kind of experience it as red the whole way through even though you know there's an unconscious or not a, a representation of this purple color is that really impossible i agree that i find it sort of sort of implausible i agree i agree but uh, it's not it doesn't seem impossible to me um so uh given that we would want to try to experimentally test you know what reason do we have for thinking that and in fact we're one one of the things we're trying to do i don't know how much i can talk about this experiment by the way but uh, because it's it hasn't been announced as far as i know who knows whatever but uh, um one of the things they're trying to do there is uh to to check whether people are aware um, of the change um or, or the colors in the background sorry not the change uh, we predict that they won't be aware. Kind of in an in, uh, intuitive way, but not an experimental way, that what's going on here is you don't conceptualize, you don't say to yourself, red, red, whatever that is. Here's another thing that, uh, now I hope this sounds... Wait, so what's, what's his idea is that you, so the idea would be you have the color quality, but you don't conceptualize it. So again, the kind of higher review that I would like to have empirically falsified if it was false, would say, look, you have the first order color quality that could be changing tracking the 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 quality of the physical object out there so you have the red quality and the purple quality but you might be aware of that as just being red the whole way through in which case you would experience red um, on the other hand that you may have the higher order state tracking what quality it is as well um, showing that you experience the color uh, even if you say that you didn't. And so I do think it's possible that there could be a kind of um, higher order state that's not the result of attention on processes directing something to the global workspace. Um, there may be other psychological neural mechanisms that uh, create the higher order state about that thing down there. So anyway, so I do think this is interesting and I do feel the pool intuitively that you must have consciously seen the color and just not been aware that the color was different. Um, that you saw the, this color at one time and you consciously saw the color at the other time and then you just didn't, um, you, you didn't conceptualize them in a way that allows you to see that this is the thing that's different. So again, it seems that you, you did, so this is his code at the beginning, this is his code at the end. So, for, you know, the guy was... So, first of all, notice this right here. You must have seen the colors before and after, so blindness is not a plausible option. That, again, is not the case because blindness could refer to you missing the conscious experience or you missing the first-order state. Um, so, blind sight is a kind of blindness because the person doesn't have conscious experience. It's a kind of sight because they're able to do stuff that requires visual information. So this may be a kind of inattentional blind sight or something like that. Just you have a representation of it and then that thing may be changing, but you may be aware of it as, oh, it's just the same color, even though the, the quality of your, in the, at the first order level is tracking the thing out there, right? And that would count as a kind of blindness, I would argue, because something's missing from your conscious experience. All right, but anyway, uh, he hasn't got to that. <laughs> Talking very likely, you did see his coat. Um, however, um, the, the, the blindness does not seem to be a plausible option, but there is another option, sometimes called um, um, inattentional amnesia, which is the idea that maybe you did see these things uh, serially and briefly accessed them, um, uh, briefly conceptualized them, but then that, that memory faded very quickly. So it doesn't really prove anything, although I think it, it, doesn't, it doesn't decide between, between the rich and sparse views, although I think it is suggestive. Um, so here's the, the fundamental problem of studying consciousness um, is this. It's that on both of these theories, with the attentional bottleneck here and the attentional bottleneck there, you end up with sparse cognition. And since cognition is what supports report, the reports might be thought to be exactly the same. Now, um, yeah, I agree. That's Stanislaus Tahan and Leon and Lakash have said have noticed this uh, th this point, and they say uh, uh, in an article from 2001, uh, Bloch's notion of phenomenal consciousness remains intractably entangled with the need to obtain subjective reports about it, 
And two, many experimental paradigms suggest that the intuitive notion of a rich but non-reportable phenomenal world is to a large extent illusory. And the, the things that they appeal to are these change blindness and inattentional blindness type phenomena. So what I'm going to argue in this talk is that there are at least three experimental paradigms that provide ways that reports can provide evidence for phenomenal consciousness independently of what I call access consciousness, which, which is just ac cognitive access to the contents of perception. So, but before I can get to those three experimental paradigms, I want to say a little more about the role of the frontal lobe and global broadcasting. So a useful thing to keep uh, of experimental paradigm is the attentional blink um, in which um, uh, you have a series of items and the subject is given two targets. Um, in this case, the targets are letters. There's a series of, of digits and the targets are letters and you see two targets. And the experimental finding is that if the subject does see the first letter and the second letter comes the right delay, with the right delay behind the, uh, the first letter, then yeah. the subject may be aware that there was a second target, but uh, be not know what the second target was. And here you can have a little, um, I'm going to give you an, an example. The uh, targets are green words. Okay. Um, I'm afraid that, you know, the, the, there's a lot of light um, on the screen, but uh, anyway, look for green words. Ah, darn it, we won't see any green words that way. Okay, how many saw two green words? <coughs> okay, of those of you who saw two Hold green on, words. Hold on, let me see that again. I didn't anyway, look for green words. Ah, darn it, we won't see any green words that way. Okay, how many saw two green words? Okay. Okay, of those of you who saw two green words, what was the first? I can't tell. tell something. Okay, if you saw throw first, now, here comes the crucial thing, whether you can identify the second or whether you will not be able to identify it or misidentify it. So those of you who saw two and got the first one as throw, what was the second? What? Okay, so some people did see it. It's mention. Um, I know, how many saw mention as, as a second? How many saw something else or, or not sure? Okay, so the, the, the potential blink phenomenon is it's a much harder to see the second one if you've, if you've correctly identified or seen the first. Now, uh, this is uh, uh, Stanislaus Tahan describing um, uh, a case of attentional blink no. and, in which um, he says uh, occipital temporal, that's the, um, um, uh, this part of the brain, this is the front of the head, this part of the brain is occipital temporal. Um, Event-related potentials evoked by an invisible word, that is a word that somebody couldn't report, like the second of those uh, two that the word mentioned, uh, were large and essentially indistinguishable from those invoked, evoked by a visible word, yet on invisible trials, the participants' visibility ratings did not deviate from the lowest value used when no word was physically present. Thus, intense occipital temporal activation can be accompanied by a complete lack of conscious report. And th the idea here is that you've got activations in the back of the head that involve reciprocal um, um, uh, activations from, from higher back of the head to lower back of the head, but attention is directed away from the stimulus, um, or at least not at the stimulus, as in the attentional blink of for the second item. And then people can't report it, but they get activation in the back of the head that's um, uh, not distinguishable from the activation in the front. Uh, the, sorry, they're not distinguishable from the cases where people do see it. Um, no, where they don't see it. Wait, wait, wait. So it did not deviate from the lowest value <coughs> used when no word was physically present. So the, the point of this slide from Stens is that uh, this activation, activation all by itself in this area can't be what consciousness consists in because you have the same kind of activation when the subjects say they don't see anything at all consciously. That's the point here. I'm sure that's what Ned was trying to say. He just kind of bungled it. It's the front. <laughs> uh, the, sorry, the, not distinguishable from the cases where people do see it. Um, okay, so here is uh, um, uh, the global workspace theory of, of Dehan and Shenzhou. Yeah. Um, that is a way of seeing what's going on. So the idea is here is that mechanisms 
are suppliers of representations. The, this is the periphery out, uh, out here. Um, consumers are um, uh, mechanisms of perceptual categorization, and um, uh, uh, re memory, reasoning, reporting, evaluating, deciding. What it broadcast in the global workspace is, is when you get a, a large enough activation in the periphery, it triggers connection with the frontal areas and they form a joint um, a co a neural coalition. And, and, and then all kinds of cognitive things can be done with that. Um, so the idea on this account is that the conscious case, you have this ignition of the, of the back to the front with, with networks. You have, this is the case of attention to the stimulus. Then s subliminal um, uh, perception would be when you um, are you're, you're attending, but you get weak activation in the back that doesn't trigger anything. And then the disputed case, which uh, uh, Dahan and Shenzhou call pre-conscious, um, uh, is the one that I, I, I just showed you. And the, the question is whether those activations really are conscious. So you could put the question like this. Does the act of moving attention from directed away to directed towards, does it enable access to pre-existing conscious phenomenology or promote an unconscious representation into consciousness? So Right, and that is a good way of putting this dispute. So you have these, this activity down here, and attention is directed away so that these things are not accessed, whatever they represent. So the question is, the, the analogy that I've used is like looking at a photograph uh, in real life, quote unquote, <laughs> versus looking at it on a computer screen. So if you want to, if you have a photo, um, like here are some notes uh, of mine right here. And uh, here, here's some notes of mine right here. And if I want to zoom into this part, I can focus in on this part. And the paper, the physical paper, doesn't cease to exist. The part that's up there, the writing is still there. But where I'm focused at is down here. And then I could go and look up there, and that bit was already there waiting for me to access it. So that's the ex accessing pre-existing conscious phenomenology. So if my phenomenology is like this paper, then I can focus in on a part of it, see what's there, notice it, etc. focus to a different part, etc. Whereas if this was on a computer screen, then focusing in on one part of the uh, uh, notes would sort of make the other parts not rendered on the screen anymore. They just wouldn't be there. So it wouldn't be like the papers, them sitting up there waiting for me to look. They just wouldn't be there until I wanted to render that part on the screen. So that's the promote and unconscious. So the unconscious bit would be like the ones and zeros in the computer memory. And the conscious bit would be like what's on the screen. And so zooming in, like if you have a PDF and you zoom in on something, then it's not like the rest of the picture is rendered off of the screen somewhere. It's just not rendered anywhere. Um, so <clears throat> it's, wait, it's a bunch of ones and zeros waiting to be rendered. If you zoom in on a different part, then it will be. So the question here is like, is, are these like the ones and zeros on the hard drive of the computer waiting to be rendered by some process, attention, higher thought, whatever? Or are they like the, the paper with already with the stuff on there, just waiting for you to notice, attend to it, et cetera. That's, that's, that's really um, the big issue. And then the issue that I'm interested in is like, what would count as empirical evidence for or against uh, one of these other two views? an unconscious representation into consciousness. So on the on one way, another way to look at it is the difference between these two things is really a difference in what one counts as conscious because uh, the global workspace account of the difference of, of these two things is the same, namely that um, only there's a bottleneck because only a small number of, of coalitions in the back of the head can trigger ignition. Um, and then the question is whether one counts the ones that don't trigger ignition, like maybe these, um, as conscious, um, uh, as the basis of conscious experience. So I suggest that the way to think about this is by um, uh, making a distinction between percepts and concepts. So let me explain what I mean by this. So I can, I can do it with a kind of uh, um, um, anecdotal thing. Um, where um, uh, 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 Bruno Latour famously claimed that Ramses II could not have died of tuberculosis since tuberculosis was discovered um, in 1882. He says, before Koch, the bacillus had no real existence. To say that Ramses II died of tuberculosis is as absurd as saying that he died of machine gun fire. So, 
the mistake he's making is he is conflating the concept of tuberculosis with tuberculosis itself. So the, uh, this helps, I'm, I'm introducing this to explain the difference between, between what, explain what I mean by a concept. So a concept, according to me, is a predicative representation that is apt to be a constituent of thought. Um, and the, the concept of, uh, of tuberculosis is, the, is this mental representation, whereas tuberculosis itself is, is, is this. Now, here's another way of seeing the difference. Um, a, babies, in many uh, experimental situations, do not seem All right, to I just noticed the time. I got to head out. This is getting interesting, though, so we can pick this up where <coughs> from here next time.